Welcome to Fruit Snacks, a weekday podcast that covers big ideas about the Christian worldview in a bite-sized format. Hey everyone, I wanted to do something a little bit different in this episode and ask a question. Do you think that the writers of the Gospels and the Apostles were well read? Do you think that they read non-religious books? Do you think they read other religious books? How well versed in the culture and in the thoughts of their day both secular and religious, do you think that they were? I think they were far more well acquainted with some of these ideas and with the cultures around them than maybe we think. And we know this because some of these documents and quotations and other non-biblical books actually make it into the Bible. Now this is related in a way to the doctrine of inspiration which I'm sure we will cover on a future episode. But for now, I want us to think about how we conceive of Scripture and its authors being inspired or influenced. I think it's important not to think of the biblical writers as somehow being locked away in solitary confinement until the book or the letter that they were writing was complete, because not only is that not realistic, It's just not historically accurate. The fact is that New Testament writers were well aware of the cultures around them, and they were even versed in a lot of the ideas and the thoughts of their day. And as I said, we know this because some of these ideas are actually referenced in the Bible. I want to give you some examples in uh, this episode that you can turn to and see just what I'm talking about. So the first one we're going to look at is actually one that comes from Paul in his letter to Titus chapter 1 verse 12. We see that Paul quotes a Cretan prophet, a prophet of their own, he says. And he says Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This is a quote from this Cretan so-called prophet. And Paul affirms what he says which is really interesting in and of itself. Probably a topic for another study at some point. But I want you to see that Paul is actually quoting a quote-unquote prophet who's apparently not a Christian and not even uh, from the Jewish religion. He's a Greek. And yet Paul quotes him and affirms what he's saying. Paul was aware of the writings of this Cretan prophet. I want to look at another example, and it is tied up into our third example. So these two are kind of together. The first one is going to be in Jude. In Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter, but in verse 6 of Jude, we read about these chains of gloomy darkness that the angels who sinned are bound up in. And if we go over to 2 Peter Chapter 2, verse 4, we find a very similar and related statement. Peter writes in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, what are we supposed to do with this phrase, chains of gloomy darkness? Because if you search for it in the Bible, I'm going to tell you right now, you won't find it. This is not a phrase that comes from the Old Testament. So where did Jude and Peter get this idea from? They actually got it from a Jewish writing not found in the Old Testament, which comes from the book of First Enoch. This was a book that would have been around or circulated in the years, the, the hundreds of years actually, leading up to the life of Jesus. And there were many who had read it at this point, and it had a lot of the thoughts that it uh, has had made their way into the culture and the thinking of the day. Broadly speaking, First Enoch is a much more 
detailed interpretation and explanation of some of what we read about in Genesis chapter 6 with the angels who came into the daughters of men and who created these Nephilim, these hybrid, part spiritual, part human abominations, which eventually gave rise to these warrior kings and the giants and Goliath and all of that. And they had to be wiped out because they were a rival seed, a rival lineage to Yahweh. Now, First Enoch is in large part a very detailed explanation of what's going on in heaven during this time and lots of conversations and even some of the specific names of certain angels who committed these, uh, these crimes. And I want to read to you some excerpts from the book of Enoch because you'll see that I think Jude and Peter were very well versed with this book. So this first example comes from 1 Enoch chapter 68, verse 39, and I'll just read it here. He sat upon the throne of his glory, and the principal part of the judgment was assigned to him, the Son of Man. Sinners shall disappear and perish from the face of the earth, while those who seduced them shall be bound with chains forever. 1 Enoch 87, 2 through 5 says this, He seized the first star which fell down from heaven. So the context is a heavenly being falling down. We get the same language of Satan in his fall in books like Ezekiel. And binding it hand and foot, he cast it into a valley, a valley narrow, deep, stupendous, and gloomy. Then one of them drew his sword and gave to it the elephants, camels, and donkeys who began to strike each other, and the whole earth shook on account of them. And when I looked in the vision, behold, one of those four angels who came forth, hurled from heaven, collected together, and took all the great stars, whose form partly resembles that of horses, and, here it is, binding them all hand and foot, cast them into the cavities of the earth." One more example, Enoch chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. Again, the Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, cast him into darkness, and opening the desert, which is in Dudael, cast him in there. Throw upon him hurled and pointed stones, covering him with darkness. So throughout Enoch, we see this word picture of spiritual beings, angels, who have sinned, who have forgotten their place and left their station, being bound with chains and being cast into a valley, a gloomy valley that is ultimately completely dark. Even examples of the Beatitudes, which Jesus gives in Matthew 5, actually have reference within the Dead Sea Scrolls that might predate Matthew 5. So it's entirely possible in a passage like that that Jesus could have actually been riffing on a known formula or a type of saying in his day and giving his own spin, his own take on it, very similarly to how Jesus taught when he said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And so I want us to see that biblical authors, and perhaps even including Jesus, were aware of the culture, the books, the writings, the teachings of the world at large, and used them to make points to their audience. And so in a similar way, I think it is interesting at least to help us think through how we might be able to leverage and use the culture and the sayings and what's popular and in the the, the zeitgeist, the, the common thought of our culture and and modern world today as a way of leveraging it to make points to our audience that will resonate with them about who God is and what Jesus has done for them. 